Hi, everyone. Welcome back to One Sustainability, our 2022 Global uh, Sustainability Conference. We are now joined by my friend and former colleague, uh, Dan Labowitz. He is the CEO of the Green Impact Exchange, also one of our strategic partners here at the One Sustainability Conference. And we thank Dan and, and the Green Impact Exchange for that as well. Dan's topic today is seeing the forest through the trees, why it's time to disaggregate ESG and how to go about doing it. So let me hand it off over to Dan. Uh, good morning, Dan, good to see you again. Good morning, Glenn, great to see you too. So thank you, look forward to your remarks. Uh, if you're ready to get rolling, we could uh, we can start and I'll join you on I the am. back end. I'm gonna share my screen for this. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, wanted to uh, introduce myself as, as Glenn mentioned, I am the CEO of the Green Impact Exchange, also known as GIX. GIX is a startup stock exchange aiming to be an SEC registered dual listing and trading venue for securities of companies that are on, on the pathway to becoming green or wanna move in, in that direction. And today I'm gonna to share with you some of my thoughts about the state of ESG and why I believe it may be time to disaggregate the E and the S and the G. Now, as Glenn mentioned, by way of background, I spent a significant part of my career in and around capital markets, including working for the NYC as the head of regulatory policy, rule development and interpretation. Um, and then for the past 10 years, I've been a consultant for banks, broker dealers, fintech companies and entrepreneurs looking to start up stock exchanges or trading venues, uh, several of them with some kind of ESG focus. About 18 months ago, my co-founders and I decided to practice what we had been consulting, and we began laying the groundwork for a green stock exchange that would focus on good green governance. We're in the early stages of registering with the SEC as a securities exchange, and we're tentatively hoping to launch the actual exchange sometime in the second half of next year. My purpose here this morning is to talk about the backdrop for our exchange, namely the current state of ESG and how we could improve it. Given the title of the presentation and my background, you won't be surprised to find out that I believe a one size fits all approach to ESG is one of several root issues holding ESG back from realizing its true potential. I will add at this point that my views on my own, they do not necessarily reflect those of the Green Impact Exchange, its partners, investors, customers, or other stakeholders. So. Um, with that disclaimer, let's begin by you know, talking about a fundamental reality. Over the past five to seven years, ESG investing has gone from a relatively small niche, $2 trillion, um, to something that demands attention. Um, it was humming along fairly evenly for about eight years, uh, till about eight years ago. And then between 2012, 2016, it uh, tripled. And then between 2016 and now, it has tripled again. Um, so there is a lot of money flowing into ESG, more than $17 trillion. And probably by the, this point, this is a 2020 number, we're probably up to 20 trillion, 25 trillion. This means there's a huge incentive for fund managers to create ESG focused funds and for companies to pay attention to ESG in order to attract some of that earmarked money. Uh, but even before we get into it, we should acknowledge that at some level, ESG is driven largely by corporate and institutional interests. Even if you say nearly a quarter of the $17 trillion represents individual and retail investors, that money is still being professionally managed. Um, and even though the beneficial owners have a role in this ecosystem and the decisions of institutional investors may be influenced by those interests, at the end of the day, the institutional investors and the asset managers and their advisors are largely in the driver's seat when it comes to ESG. Um, so with that in mind, let's play out the string on green investment and, and use this as an example. What are some of the things that are motivating green investors? On the top row are the things that these investors see as the current impacts of human activity. Consumption outstripping annual resource budgets, over-reliance on fossil fuels, pollution, and other bad outputs, environmental degradation, and loss of biodiversity. On the bottom row are some of the potential uh, future effects, climate effects such as heat stress, lack of water and food, and projected waste production uh, without a reasonable solution for what to do with it. Now, despite this parade of horribles, there is another important thing that is motivating um, green investors kind of, or any ESG investor. They are, believe it or not, optimists. They believe that while corporations may have contributed to the problem um, up to this point, corporations are also part of the solution. If they didn't believe that, they wouldn't be investors. They would be activists demanding that governments shut down corporations or put them out of business. 
but instead they're buying shares and they're demanding from the inside that corporations do something different. The fact they're working within the system reflects their optimistic belief that it can work. And I believe as an aside that this optimism is warranted. In human history, we've created only a handful of institutions capable of affecting change at a regional or global scale. Um, historically, it has been limited to governments and militaries and to some extent, religion and academia. But in the modern era, I would add corporations to that list. I mean, if you think about what it means that you can order a product in China and have it on your doorstep tomorrow morning, you're saying something about the extent of the global su supply chain. For as much as that has been in crisis lately, it reflects a triumph of corporations motivating and coordinating the actions of hundreds of thousands or millions of people to move in the same direction for the same purpose. Um, or think about space exploration. It used to be the sole province of government, and today there is a privatized space industry. And the same is true of communications and road building and all sorts of innovation. When, it, when, when properly motivated and incentivized, corporations are capable of doing things at a scale that would have been unimaginable 200 years ago and unfathomable 400 years ago. But the key is motivation and incentive. And ESG, which tries to catalog and capture the inputs and outputs of those in incentives, is part of an ecosystem, which, uh, as we'll discuss in a minute. Uh, in the meantime, let's quickly talk about how this would play out in that one realm, the climate arena. And this is a stand-in for the other arenas, but I want to focus on one to kind of give us an example. For now, it suffices to say that investors are looking for opportunities to invest in saving the planet, and companies largely are beginning to understand that this presents a solid opportunity for profit. The, the system is therefore nominally working as it should, but I say nominally because there is friction in the system. In particular, how do you measure the degree to which a company is actually doing what it says? Now, ESG criteria is one mechanism that we can use to start answering that question. But even with an alphabet soup of metrics, it's difficult for companies to credibly prove their mettle in either environmental or social or governance spheres. And that presents a critical problem for ESG because it means it can't quite deliver on its promise. So why is that? Well, to start uh, answering that question, let's look at the state of ESG today. The epistemological question, the core question that it's trying to resolve is this. How do you know if a company is walking the talk? So the answer, or one answer, is to measure everything. And by everything, I mean everything. MSCI and others like Bloomberg and Sustainalytics have broken down each part of ESG into specific areas of focus and then use a proprietary methodology to score companies along various dimensions and come up with a combined ESG score. And thus we have the E, and then we have the S, and then we have the G. And these scores often rely on publicly available information or assumptions and extrapolations created by the rating provider using proprietary methodologies. The core problem to me is that there isn't an effective way to prioritize among the various dimensions. As a result, a company that is great at E, but terrible at S, could have the same overall score as a company that is great at S, but terrible at E. In the end, I, by trying to measure everything in a single amalgamated system, the metric ends up being too general and too subjective to be effective. And this leads me to my first conclusion, which is that ESG is too broad as an amalgamated concept to distinguish between the realms. But it's not just that the E plus the S plus the G is too broad. It's also that the proprietary and divergent nature of the ratings doesn't lead to consistent results. Now, this is a chart comparing the ratings of the three largest ESG ratings agencies. The Y-axis is the first name in any of the pairs, and the X-axis is the second name. So the blue dots on the far left show that MSCI gave a very low rating in the single digits to companies where Bloomberg gave them ratings as high as 59 out of 100. And similarly on the far right, MSCI gave a 100 out of 100 to five companies that Bloomberg rated in the high 20s up to the high 50s. And the same pattern recurs for the other pairings. So the ESG ratings, as it turns out, correlate on average between 40 and 60% of the time. By contrast, consider that credit agency ratings tend to correlate 95 to 97% of the time. And part of the problem, to quote uh, Shiva Rajkapal at Columbia University, is that, quote, ESG ratings represent unfalsifiable claims. How would I know that credit ratings potentially messed up if I observe a significant number of cases where the credit rating agency assigns a AAA stamp to securities that defaulted in droves during the financial crisis, 
I could make a case that the rating agency messed up. I don't know what a default for ESG ratings looks like. And that leads me to my second conclusion. May, uh, ratings are simply too divergent to be helpful proxies. So maybe the problem is that we're relying on a third party to do our work for us. Maybe what we need is more and better information from companies. And this is where SASB and TCFD and others have staked their flags. Focus on data using a tool that we already are familiar with, namely materiality. And this approach tries to identify and measure how a company is doing based on whether a particular criterion is material to the company's financial results or operations. It's kind of an outside in view, which things the from the outside world will threaten something inside the four walls of my company and what is the likely impact on my business. The problem is that this approach quickly becomes unwieldy. Um, SASB has broken down ESG into five dimensions and 26 general issues that are then mapped across 11 industry classifications, which leads to 286 variables. And if you expand the industry classifications into the 77 individual industries, as SASB does, you're looking at over 2,000 variables. And on top of that, the data is not necessarily the same across those variables because the company decides what's material and therefore what to disclose. In contrast to an amalgamated ESG score, a materiality standard is almost too granular. What's more, materiality tends to be divorced from the context that would make it useful and because it lacks context, it's on the consumer of the data to investigate and find the context, rather than the producer of the data giving the reason why the data is relevant and useful. The materiality by itself doesn't really tell the full story. As some of you may be familiar with the concept from knowledge management showing the progression from data to wisdom. It basically says data by itself has no meaning, that's just numbers. When you start to organize those numbers into rows and columns on a, on a spreadsheet, you get information. When you identify a particular trend or pattern, now you have knowledge. And when you classify those trends in order to extrapolate new information that wasn't in the original data itself, we refer to that as understanding. And finally, when you can use your understanding to predict future trends and take action, we call that wisdom. So materiality tends to actually fall in the low end of that progression, which leads to my third conclusion. Materiality standards provide important data, but they don't provide wisdom. We're still missing the forest for the trees because we're either focusing um, on outsourcing understanding and wisdom to a third party, or we're just gathering data. So how do we get out of this morass? How can we move along the scale from data up to wisdom? So there seems to be this assumption that when it comes to companies, we're stuck with aggregated amalgamated information because companies are large and reporting is complicated. And anyway, companies really don't want to disaggregate and they don't want to be held accountable in any one realm. But is that really true? It's not true when you're talking about things other than equities. Companies, large ones at that, seem to have no problem issuing sustainability bonds that are tied to specific areas like environmental sustainability or diversity goals. They also regularly tie executive compensation to achievement of discrete goals in one realm or another. And they even extend credit on terms that are connected to achievement of discrete goals in one ESG realm, but not necessarily others. Yet somehow we assume that when it comes to stock prices and enterprise value, we're stuck with the ESG tools we have. So here, I want to pause and reflect on what it is that we're actually trying to capture when we talk about ESG. Or to put it in another way, what do understanding and wisdom actually look like? What would you want to know if you were trying to predict what a company will do when it comes to specific areas? Now, if this were a live conference, at this point, I would try a thought experiment with the audience and ask people to shout out what they would want to know in order to predict a company's approach without knowing which ESG realm we were talking about. But since we don't have that capability, I will answer my own question. Might it look something like this? Instead of focusing on data, I would start with, who is the company? What do its leaders say about it? What, is it, what do they profess is its purpose? And then does the company's leadership know who its core stakeholders are? And does it engage with them? Next, I would ask if management sets goals that are consistent with the values and stakeholders' interests. And do they have a strategy for achieving those goals? 
And finally, I would ask if the company measures its progress towards its goals to ensure that it is continually aligned and whether the company holds itself accountable when it's not aligned. Importantly, you need to note that I left data and measurement to the very end after values and vision. That's because I believe that you can learn a lot about a company by understanding its culture and its approach to the business. The data is crucially important, but only once, uh, if it only has meaning once you understand the context in which it was produced. In other words, the values and the vision are what move us from data to understanding and wisdom. So next, I want to tackle the disaggregation question. How do you, one, focus attention on one realm over another? Two, give the company a meaningful way to prove it's credibly committed to change? And three, give investors a meaningful way to express their support for that change? In the case of bonds and credit, we saw that there could be meaningful differentiation at a product level. For equities overall, I would posit you need a specialized equity venue. And GIX happens to be an example of such a, a specialized venue. We're focused on several things. First and most obvious, it's an exchange focused on the E in ESG. This is because there are investors who are primarily motivated by the E, and there are investors who are primarily motivated by the S, and there are investors who are primarily motivated by the G, and they may care about other realms, but each group has its preference, E or S or G. Our exchange caters to the group that cares most about E. That's not to say that the S or the G are unimportant. It's just that they are not the primary value on which the exchange is focusing attention. And we just believe that this results in greater alignment between investors who care about green and companies who care about green. And by listing, the company is making a choice about what it wants to be measured on first and foremost. It's saying, please look at me for this. Second, GAX acts as a third-party validator. In order to list on the exchange, a company must adopt standards that embody the governance principles that we just looked at. If they don't abide by them, they're at risk of delisting. The beauty of this is that by making the choice to list, the company communicates to the world that it is holding itself to a higher standard because it is willing to risk delisting, which is a publicly reportable event. GIX is the neutral third party verifying that the company is abiding by the green governance principles. We don't have a choice in this because we're a regulated exchange. If we don't enforce our listing rules, the SEC can sanction us. And this leads to the third benefit. Investors can rely on the exchange as a marker of which companies are credibly committed and which companies are not. The ones who are committed are the ones who are listed. It therefore simplifies the investment selection process. No more looking at all of the materiality data or trying to unpack all of the ratings or trying to figure out which realm is, is which. Finally, the exchange provides investors with a way to signal their approval or disapproval of a company's green commitment. Ordinarily, today, when an investor buys or sells on the NYSC or NASDAQ, the intent behind their trade is masked by the noise of the overall market. The exception is when an investor sells short, which signals the investor's belief that the price of the stock is overvalued and due to fall. The exchanges publish short interest reports showing the amount of short selling and issuers take notice. They often complain about it. If a green impact investor wants to send a comparable signal today, there is no mechanism. Um, when the GIX is up and running, however, sending that same order to the GIX, a dedicated green venue, signals that the investor has what we call green intent. Their order communicates something fundamental to the market that doesn't exist today. In essence, a specialized exchange answers a fundamental question. Who's walking the talk in one realm or another of ESG? In our case, it's green, but it could just as easily be social or governance. And if someone is or isn't walking the talk, a specialized venue lets investors send a directional signal to the entire market. And that's true accountability, the enforceability of the exchange's listing rules and the market signaling from trading. As an aside, I would note that we don't expect to trade only the currently green companies. The old saying is that you rob banks because that's where the money is. And the same is true with the, the environment, brown industries. In our view, most of the companies are in the A position in the lower left corner there, meaning that they have low sustainability and low governance. And that's how you make change. Um, if a company adopts the green governance standards, our expectation is that initially they would have good green governance, but not necessarily quick sustainability improvements to show for it. And that's because it takes a long time to turn a battleship. It starts, however, with putting the rudder in the correct position to turn. And that's what we're trying to do. 
Once a company has lived with good governance, we would expect that it would move to the upper right corner. Um, and by the way, the same is true with companies that have a, a high sustainability factor coming in. Um, they just start in a better position. But even if they exhibit reasonably good results on sustainability, good green governance will tend to move them higher and to the right on the graph. So why do we think this is the right solution? Well, let me start with voice. Investors today simply mostly don't have one. This is the typical institutional flow. Workers give their pension investment money to, uh, to, a, pension uh, to a pension fund, a union or a state, which buys index funds for someone whose job is to assemble funds according to some criteria, say the S&P 500 or the MSCI index. The fund is most likely managed by one of the big three, BlackRock, State Street, or Vanguard, which invests in various issuers in the hopes that they will generate positive returns. And this is known as triple agency. But when it comes time to vote on ESG matters, the big three, not the beneficial owner, tend to make the decision. And even then, they're not acting on their own. They are advised by the ISSs and Glass Lewises of the world, and by advisors and lawyers, and ultimately by the decisions of the Delaware Chancery Court. All of which mean that beneficial owners' preferences, to the extent that they can even be known, are drowned out by the so-called professionals who know better. Meanwhile, shareholder democracy tends to be less, uh, significantly less effective than advertised. This is the result of the 2022 proxy season, the first half, compiled by the law firm Oric. These are the uh, 221 proposals uh, received by 98 of the 250 uh, Fortune 250 companies. Of those, 21 shareholder approvals were, were approved. Of those, nine were related to the environment. And of those, only three were endorsed, endorsed by the board. So think about what that means. If you are an executive or a board member, the message you take away is that shareholder proposals are not much to worry about. You've just extinguished the investor's voice. An exchange, by contrast, aggregates investors' voices into a metric that CEOs and boards understand, trading volume and pricing signals. signals. Investors can show instant and ongoing approval or disapproval by investing or divesting on the market in real time. So what are some of the other benefits that there are to a specialized exchange? We've talked about the amalgamation of E and S and G obscuring differences among the various dimensions. Focusing on a single dimension promotes informational clarity that draws in green aligned investors. It also aligns with demographic trends. Millennial investors are poised to participate in one of the greatest wealth transfers in human history as the baby boom generation ages and millennials inherit their wealth. As a group, millennials have a greater interest in sustainable investing than their predecessors. A green exchange lets them express that intent. Millennials are also more confident that sustainable investment can have an impact on corporate behaviors. But interestingly, they don't feel that they're well served by the existing frameworks for evaluating ESG performance. When asked uh, if the time and effort required to understand sustainable investing was a barrier to their investment, three out of four of them said yes. This suggests a new and simpler mechanism would help millennials figure out where to put their resources in order to be most effective. Next, we believe there needs to be meaningful accountability. Some observers believe that the market can provide its own form of accountability. And here's what Larry Fink had to say on just that point. Note, of course, by the way, the discussion a few minutes ago about shareholder voting. But in any case, the market seemed to agree with Larry Fink, as evidenced by what the Business Roundtable published the next year, saying that they were embracing sustainable practices. But the painful truth is that research has shown that many of the Business Roundtable signatories were not walking the talk, which leaves them open to accusations of greenwashing. Without a specialized venue, there was no mechanism for green investors to express that reaction. Finally, I believe that a specialized exchange focused on governance rather than specific sets of metrics addresses a hole in the market's understanding of ESG, right in the center of the Venn diagram, the role of credible commitment and credibility. Without enforceability and accountability, ESG, despite millions of hours spent developing and implementing metrics and frameworks and agreements and guidelines, remains a fancy set of suggestions, not much more. And ex a specialized exchange creates accountability in a specific realm, which will help clarify the landscape 
while still leveraging the existing work that's done, been done to date. So thank you for your attention and Glenn, I turn it back to you for if there's any Q&A. Thank you, thank you, Dan. Great, great job. Great, great presentation. Great, great set of slides. I, I love the uh, getting the rudder to turn analogy that that's 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 rather rather important in, in, in thinking about you think about intent uh, yeah. we all we all know this there's just so much so much measurement trying to go on and metrics and people cherry pick certain statistics and then they point to see look we're, we're, we're doing this from a holistic standpoint it sounds like that that's what that's what you guys are focusing on okay on the east side but holistically and walking walking the talk is rather important and as we know as an SRO once you once you publish those those listing standards and people are otherwise applying, that's it. Either either you, either either they're doing it or they're not. And you guys will be from a from an oversight uh, and accountability side right there and step with them, saying, okay, well, listen, this is uh, you need to either improve here or or, or not, or you or you're or you're following you're following the rules or, or you're not. Uh, and what a what a great. What, what a great, I mean, the whole concept of moving, moving to wisdom, right? Data being one extreme, wisdom being the other, and then recognizing this journey along, yeah. along that path. Now you mentioned, you mentioned dual listing. Uh, that would be, that would be the initial, the initial intent. Yeah, we, we, we realized that as a startup exchange, there, there are a lot of reasons why a company wants to be on the NYSE and the NASDAQ. And we, 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 we understand that they provide depth and liquidity and services and things that we don't think we could reasonably compete with at this stage. Dual listing is a way of saying you can have that and you can also signal your credible commitment to the, the cause of, I want to be a better green player. Um, and we, it, it's additive. Uh, we actually, you know, we, we, we don't think the NYC and NASDAQ are bad places. We think they're doing great work in, what, in the things that they do. They've just said that this isn't an area that they feel that they can, can intrude into. Oh, I, I remember 15, 20 years ago, uh, lots of times the environmental groups are coming back and asking, or even the, the SASB in its early days saying, why, why can't you have a listing standard that reflects this? And, right. now, you, and now you guys are you guys are the future. You're right, and that's the other thing I would just add. We're, we're not trying to displace SASB or TCFD or any of the other metrics. One of our requirements is the company needs to commit to reporting that data and information in a uh, format, either SASB or TCFD or whatever, and explain both why you chose that one and how you interpret materiality. So again, we're trying to give investors more information about the process so that investors can then figure out for themselves what whether or not they agree with how moving, again, from data to wisdom. Yeah, no, yeah, it cl clearly you, you move beyond just uh, a checklist. And, and again, the intent, the holistic nature of it, the narrative around it. Again, you, you're you're climbing under the hood, and you're looking you're looking at the culture of the company. To go back to your values, vision, and action uh, slide as well. You're you're kind of right. you know what is that intent? Are you fulfilling it? Um, and you know, and if so, then obviously people will vote vote with their with their feet, and and they'll be in on the stock. Uh, and again, you'll you'll have you'll have companies in good standing as well, which is which is fantastic. Well, listen, just fantastic, Dan. Thank you for joining us today. Dan, Dan Labowitz, the CEO of the Green Impact Exchange, wishing you the best of luck here um, going forward. Uh, tremendous work, great ideas, and just just uh, just tremendous here, tremendous promise here into, into the future. So well, we're, we're, I'm excited that we could be a, a part of the uh, conference and that support what, what One Business World is doing. Um, so glad we could glad we could make this work. Now, thanks for your presentation this morning for One Sustainability. Great work. Best of luck in the future. Look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Take care, Dan. Thanks. Thanks.